Merck MERC is the Mississippi Education Reform Collaborative. It is a collaboration of school superintendents who come together to do what's best for children and their communities. They share resources, ideas, training, all to accelerate student and school achievement. Today we're excited to have the second of a five-part series of the Merck Leadership Academy. Today's focus is on curriculum and instructional design. The featured speaker is Dr. Robert Marzano, an internationally renowned education reform expert. He's coming to share his wisdom around what's required to have high reliability schools. We know what to do to make schools better. We really do. We've had decades, and I'd say five, six decades of uh, research basically, you know, looping back and saying the same thing. We know the variables to work on. It's just implementing those. And implementing those means we have to not just try things out, but monitor how well they're, they're working. And that's where we fall short. We implement a lot of good programs. Uh, in Mississippi, you have a lot of good programs going on. But it's one thing to implement a program or a practice. It's another thing to actually track to see whether it's working or not. And sometimes it'll work and sometimes it won't work. And when it's not, we, we correct the errors. And really, that's the piece we're missing. Your assessment of where Mississippi public schools are now and where they need to be? Um, well, I've had a chance to work with all 50 states over the years. Uh, Mississippi's a great state. Uh, actually, I find Mississippi educators, you know, very, just uh, very wonderful people. You know, they're very cordial people. Uh, Mississippi doesn't have the funding, per people funding, uh, that other states do, and that's certainly a factor. It really is. Uh, it's not insurmountable, but it's no, it's, it, you know, it, it, it's no small obstacle. Uh, actually, it was at school in Beijing, uh, that Beijing High School 80. We spent a, I think it was 14 days, I forgot, but we were in a lot of classrooms, and my question was, how do they get such high scores in the Gao Cao? Because that's their big test. Uh, you know, so we saw classes in Mandarin, we saw classes in English, and they were good teachers, but no better than U.S. teachers. Right. They really, I mean, they were dedicated, but you know what was different was the curriculum and the review. Mm. Our math curriculum compared to theirs, ours is like that, theirs is like that. They teach a handful of things in great depth. And what that allows them to do, I, I use the term cumulative review. They continually go back and review. Right. And knowing a few things well allows you to attach other things more easily. It really does. So everything's, so no kidding, knowing symbiosis well allows you to attach commensalism. You follow me? No kidding, know a few things well and that other stuff, even if you don't test it, will have, you know, the Velcro to, to stick on. So it's not... We're just doing it the wrong, trying to cover everything means you cover nothing. Well, yeah, so, I mean, this is, this is so juicy, right, uh, by way of a conversation, right, because there is, there is the biology textbook that's got 800 pages in it. Yep. The directive is to get through the 800 pages, right, without regard to the, the depth. I got it. Right? Yeah. Um, too much of what we do is driven by, by the materials that we use to teach. So how do we get this content knowledge, right? So my name is Irving. I'm a fifth grade teacher. I need to be doing algebra I got it. in fifth grade. I haven't learned it in my preparation program. I got it. What's the content knowledge and how do we close that gap I got it. Right, on the content knowledge in order to do the depth, Boy. kindergarten through 12th grade that you advocate? These, right? are, these are good questions. I'm not talking with you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, baby, you're rubbing off on me, man. So I, I'm, I'm growing up here big time. I want to be okay. just like you. Okay. Uh, no, no, no. The, uh, uh, well, here's how you do it. Um, and I didn't get a chance to get into this, but uh, first of all, if you narrowed the content, and remember that we, we use that rubric, the three is the target, two is the simpler stuff, four is more complex. Uh, each one of those require a different type of instruction, each one of those levels. So this basic stuff usually has to be taught directly. Really, direct instruction is direct not instruction. bad. It's got to be taught in a very systematic way to students. Now, that is the hardest type of lesson for a teacher to teach because it takes in a lot of content knowledge. Right. You follow me? Why does every teacher, why do all 3.3 million teachers, why do we expect every one of them to do that well? It's the uh -huh. hardest thing to do. So here's another cut. Yeah. You know, take... You got your topics, you got 25 top topics for Algebra 1. Each one of those has a scale. Each one of those has certain content that should be taught directly. Why not get the best teachers or, to present content and do that and video it, record it? And actually, Japan's lesson study movement is designed to do that. That content that should be directly taught what they do is they loop through, they keep developing lessons, they vet them, and they were trying to create a national curriculum 
Why not do that here? You know, why not a big district? You know, why couldn't you, you know, pick your, again, all based on a handful of topics. And we know the content that has to be directly taught. Get people who are our best teachers, you know, who know the content, know teaching. And it is direct presentation. It's not all lecture, you know, but it is direct, you know, direct presentation. Have them do those. Now, I'm the teacher. I want to teach. I'm not great at that. You know, why don't I just turn the video on and say, let's watch, you know, Mrs. Smith. You know, give us this presentation. And that's what makes, like, the Khan Academy so popular. Short little bits, bingo. So I think the day of expecting every teacher to be the great stand and deliverer is gone because everybody can't be a great stand. That's the thing I think it takes a long time. You have to know your content so well and I've moved to it so many times. Why do we expect every teacher to do that? When they're out there, the state of Mississippi probably has a whole bunch of incredible Algebra One teachers. You could identify the content. Let's get them you know, virtually recorded and let teachers use that. So that takes the load of the content knowledge off of me. Now I become more, I got to know my content, but not at the level to put it together into this well-crafted lesson. I have to know my content so I can interact with the students and I'm a good facilitator. And then you add students helping one another. Right. Uh, yeah, so now, so you're right. That, that's a huge, the way we have the system set up, every teacher has to be great at everything. Yeah. And direct, direct instruction is the hardest thing to be good at. And so, so I, I'm going to, this is my last question, then I'm going to open this up and get some folks uh, out in the audience uh, to ask you some questions. But in, in your, in, in the recent books and in other books uh, that you've um, uh, authored, you talk about micro-teaching. Yeah. And this conversation about direct instruction, yeah, yeah. the best teachers doing the, the best instruction, suggests to me uh, micro teaching. What is that? Can you tell us what, sure. what teaching is uh, all about? Yeah, actually, I think it was John, I think it was Hattie's sixth rank variable. Yes. It was, it's in the top 10, I know that. It was the highest ranked instructional variable, it really was. And micro teaching, actually, about 30 years old, uh, it was a method of teacher preparation, uh, which I kind of described. You picked a very few things to work on, okay, and then you were given feedback on those very, very specific strategies. So the way it would play out is that, uh, I mean, kind of that, uh, although they don't call it micro teaching anymore, uh, at least that I know of, uh, you know, I, I would be working on two or three strategies. You'd come into my class and observe me, or you'd videotape me, you know, and then you'd sit down with me and we'd critique not just my whole general lesson. Okay, Bob, you were using Don Ogle's KWL strategy. Let's say just so that you know it's that it's that level of focus, and that and that's where the whole teacher evaluation uh, conversation comes in. Teacher evaluation should be about you know a very few things to get that seven and a half here, seven and a half, eighty-five percent here. But now for development, each of us are working on very specific things and at a micro level. And you get coaching buddies, you come in and observe me. We pick the same thing. You know, you're more senior to me in terms of your teaching. You know, so you you critique me. And you critique me honestly, you know, and, and, and I'm okay with that because I know I'm not good at it. Right. You know, I asked you for help. Again, I think, I, think, I think it was the sixth rated variable out of 150 variables. And nobody talks about it. I said, my guys, it's kind of obvious, isn't it? Yeah. That, that if you want to improve teaching, why don't we adapt some as, uh, aspects of micro-teaching? If we implement what we know works, you know, we'll see you know, students uh, you know, in, in learning improve. Now, uh, in schools and districts where uh, students are coming from, uh, uh, we have a lot of deficits in terms of their previous academic knowledge, you know, uh, they'll learn, but it's going to take them a little while to uh, catch up. You know, but that, that can absolutely be done. I'll go back to the Mississippi educator. I think Mississippi educators are they're, they're passionate people, uh, and so for Mississippi, particularly in uh, some areas, you know, where there aren't a lot of external resources, uh, if they take on the type of school reform we know that works, uh, they'd be a model for the rest of the country. Uh, I think the country's uh, suffering from this notion that, well, you know, there are things that are insurmountable here. You know, there are some students that we're just not going to be able to get to. That's absolutely not true. Give us your assessment of the American education system compared, for instance, to the education system in China. Uh, the, well, I've traveled a little bit. I've worked in about 15 to 20 different countries. I'm no expert in that, but I certainly have opinions. Uh, 
uh, us versus other countries. Uh, uh, there's some generalities I think they're pretty accurate. One is we try to teach way more content than most other countries, really. Uh, you know, recently in China, working with one high school out there for a couple of years, uh, and they have a, you know, a big test at the end, it's called the Gao Cao. Uh, but the way they approach the curriculum for that test is very different from us. We try to teach everything. They try to teach, you know, just a handful of things, but teach it very, very well. So in general, the United States tries to, or the curriculum, we try to teach way more than most countries that we want to emulate. Uh, another thing that separates us from other countries is we're highly decentralized. You know, we have 50 states, uh, which means we have 50 systems at least, and most people say it's not, you know, 50 systems, and we have about 12 to 13,000 school districts, and you could say we actually then have 12 to 13,000 systems. Uh, so we're very, very de decentralized. That's part of our strength, that's part of our weakness too. So reform for us, or effective, uh, uh, effective education, has to start at the school level. It really does. You get a really tight school, which means that you know that we know that what's happening in classrooms is well organized, well or orchestrated, and that scrolls up into a tight district, and then that scrolls up to a tight state. We have to start at the school level. Mississippi has become, unfortunately, accustomed to being at the bottom. We don't always value what education can do for both the individual, for the community, and for our state. In the midst of the education reform movement that's happening nationally, what we found is we have to rethink how we educate our young people. We need to bring our best minds, best skills, best thinking to the table. One of the ways to do that is to bring experts into the state in front of people to have a back and forth dialogue about what is it that we need to do and do differently and that's what today is. Today is again one of the series about how do we begin to transform the work that's happening in schools and in districts to accelerate achievement. A topic today is curriculum instruction in K-12 schools throughout the state of Mississippi. We have a large number of school districts from the state who have come together to participate in today's uh, 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 academy, which uh, has its focus on curriculum instruction. Dr. Robert Mazzano is a keynote speaker, and uh, after his presentation this morning, all of the uh, 300 or so uh, participants are going to participate in workshops that are specific to accelerating uh, academic achievement by enriching and strengthening curriculum instruction in schools in the state. <laughs> Our workshop today uh, is being hosted by the Jackson Public Schools Career Development Center Engineering to Students. Um, the workshop will teach administrators how to incorporate STEAM, which stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Arts, and Mathematics, into their uh, courses, coursework at their schools. The second year engineering students at the Jackson Public Schools Career Development Center have an opportunity to travel to Nissan once a month to train in programming robots. Um, once the students complete the training, they have an opportunity to compete for scholarships as well as uh, money for their school. And once they complete the program as well, they can walk away with a certification. What kind of response have you seen from the students? Actually, a few weeks ago, we had an award ceremony at our school, and we had a guest visitor, a former Nissan STEP program participant, who is now a uh, engineer with IBM. So that's the greatest result, success of our students. In that child's hand, a diploma. The topic of our workshop is using data to drive personalized instruction. We begin to look at multiple points of uh, data in terms of uh, anything outside of test scores and how does that impact the child directly uh, in terms of learning goals and addressing the whole child as opposed to just uh, the overall measurables of a simple test score. What kind of results have you seen from the students? Students have been able to take ownership of their learning. They can tell you what they're learning, how far they've come, and where they need to go, which means they're more motivated to work harder and to work independently in terms of uh, becoming better scholars as opposed to just sitting in a classroom for nine to 10 months out the year. May 2013. The topic of our workshop is uh, blended learning courses in K-12 education. 
Uh, blended learning is basically integrating technology into the classrooms uh, where teachers can uh, use them to leverage a lot of learning for students. Um, uh, with that, they can use a lot of free digital tools online to uh, enhance the learning experiences for the students. Uh, the students are able to turn in their assignments online uh, from anywhere. Uh, via mobile, uh, you can use uh, tablets or laptops. Uh, so it's basically taking the school outside of school and taking it to the community. What kind of response have you seen, results from the students? Uh, the students love it. Uh, they love the fact that their curriculum is now enhanced, so there's a lot of things that they can explore, uh, a lot of questions that they have they can Google and, and explore even deeper. Uh, they also like the fact that uh, their material is online, so it's very easy for them to you know, move from one device to another and still see their work is there. So they're not going to lose their work. It's always in the cloud, like they say. The topic of my uh, workshop today is student research, artifacts, and presentations. Um, I really, that's how my, my classroom runs. And I, we, my, my classroom runs on student choice. And so we uh, work around, I'm a, an English language arts teacher, fifth grade. So we choose um, themes or topics and we choose literature around that and then they take that literature and we do conversations around that. We do projects and activities and um, do lots of research and publishing of newspapers, lots of writing. Um, I'm a Delta Area Writing Project person and I'm National Board Certified, so going through those, I've learned a lot of strategies with that. What kind of results have you seen uh, from the students? Um, the students are engaged, very engaged. They, instead of that, wrote, um, read a story, answer questions. When they have choice, over what they read and their the books that they choose, then they're more they're eager and they're more engaged in the the literature. My workshop is writing across the curriculum, and this is very important so um, that children will be able to improve their writing, and it's reinforced by writing in every subject area. Uh, for example, I teach law and public safety, and uh, of course, mine is not a, a uh, academically tested area, although it is CTE, but uh, let's say if someone decided to go into law enforcement, they would have to be well versed in writing to write reports, uh, things of that nature. Also um, in writing in your English classes, uh, that carries over with your history, uh, even in math, you have word problems. So these things are very important. What kind of response have you had from the students? The students, uh, at first they were kind of um, they didn't like it at first, but now they're becoming more receptive to it now that they see how it ties in with their um, English classes and they see that it helps to reinforce, as I said earlier, their, uh, their English and English has become easier for them in terms of grammar and writing it has become much easier for them. Here are some characteristics of Education 3.0. We know that school needs to be relevant to them. Kids need to understand why it is that you said that they have to learn. The topic of our workshop is digital content and pedagogy. The purpose is to inform district leaders about how to use digital content appropriately in a way that is innovative and that gets the kids engaged in their own learning and it, it be student-centered and to get them to understand that it really is about getting kids prepared for college and career readiness by providing them with rigorous content and using the resources that they already use in, at their hands to engage them and inform their instruction. What kind of results have you seen in the classroom? What I've seen across the southeast is for those school districts who have really committed to providing the budget and the funds and the professional development to the teachers to really flip their classrooms and personalize learning. Their dropout rates have decreased. The kids are coming out with gradu higher graduation rates than ever and they're more prepared for college. But the topic of the seminar today is about museum websites, in particular art museum websites, and um, helping educators know how to use uh, such websites for teaching children elementary school through uh, teenage years, through high school. Tell us the importance of uh, students learning art uh, in the uh, elementary schools and continuing on through uh, high school. Oh, art is a lens onto a remarkable array of uh, 
subjects. Uh, almost any subject can be uh, looked at through art. Art is a, an important visual manifestation of um, politics, of religious issues, of philosophy, of math, of social studies, of history, everything can be looked at through the lens of art. So a very valuable tool for educators. The title of our workshop today is going to be Why and How Algebraic Standards Are Being Implemented in Elementary and High School Classrooms. Tell us about teaching algebra in the elementary grades. It is very important that teachers begin to teach algebra at earlier ages. This is because math is not an independent variable. We have to be able to make um, comparisons in math to where students are fluently multiplying, adding, dividing, subtracting, but take it into real world context. And algebra allows students to do that. They're able to think and reason more appropriately. What kind of results have you seen in your classroom from your methods? from our methods at East Jasper School District by giving them performance tasks which allows the students to sit back and go through the problems. They're able to reason themselves without too much teacher interaction. This allows them to understand the computations and be able to present their models out in front of the class and explain their justifications and reasoning. The P3E we have a data analytic platform in which we work with school districts to extract data from various data silos and we visualize the data for principals and executive staff. So assessment data, attendance data, behavior data, teacher observation data. We work to make the consumers use that data in a friendly way. Um, right now that doesn't happen. So that is what we're doing with school districts. What kind of results have you seen so far? So the results we've seen is data usage uh, has picked up, right? So the school districts that we work with um, through training and retraining um, from year to year, uh, we know this because we get demands now from principals and executive teams. When we first started, they were open to everything that we suggested, and now they're specifically requesting data in a specific format. That's a huge learning you know, curve there because they went from this one uh, position where they were just consuming what we gave them, and now they're requesting data in a specific way. So it's never ending. So I get calls in various days that says, hey, can you connect this data set to this data set because it would help me in this particular way. And what kind of uh, value does that have for the local school systems in improving uh, instruction? Well, they save time, first of all, because there's very little time in manipulating the data. And, and we believe they save money because they don't spend time doing that. Um, so when they want to create a treatment for specific students or groups of students, they can do that immediately after test results are generated. Um, when they want to improve attendance, they don't wait for some type of a district report. Any type of user in the system can pull up the data they're seeking and apply a strategy for improvement. So we've seen attendance rates go up, we've seen behavior incidents go down, um, and with testing accountability, because it's changing so much, it's hard to put metrics on that, right? Because, for example, testing data just came out in the state of Mississippi. I'm excited. I'm excited that the, the variety of people who are coming here, I'm hearing from an international person in, a fair, in, in what is considered a very small setting, and a p person who hasn't been to Mississippi in a very long time. People who take out their day to come and learn what things they need to do in their district. People want more for their children. They want more for their communities. They want more for themselves. And the beginning of that is the willingness to learn and challenge what it is what that you know to do better. Today is that opportunity to do that. I think the Merck Leadership Academy is phenomenal. I've been a part of Merck now since its inception, and um, it's just been outstanding. Today we've talked about Marzano and actually had the opportunity to sit and meet with him. And and that's just, it's unheard of, um, really on a number of levels. It's almost like being a kid and listening to all of the Michael Jackson tapes and going to the concert, but then having an opportunity to stand in line and get that autograph and get that picture. That's what it was like for us uh, to have Marzano here with us today and for him to talk with us about curriculum and instruction, um, assessing more and testing less, vocabulary, and just giving us strategies that we could take back to our school district and use real time 
right now with our students to make a difference. It's very, very important. The Merck Academy is very valuable because it allows educators to come together across the state of Mississippi and discuss ideas that are plaguing many of our districts. We get to share, we get to learn, we get to laugh, and we get to prosper as a group as opposed to in our isolated districts. The Merck Leadership Academy uh, for me has really taught me uh, there are so many factors that are important to create um, an effective school, an effective district, and you really can't have that with you know without colleagues that will uh, collaborate with you, share best practices with you, and you really you can put a price on that. I, it's been amazing. Um, I've really enjoyed the opening session with Dr. Marzano. It, um, it's almost overwhelming. There's so much, and but it, it, it excites. It's very exciting. The value of the Merck Leadership Academy is uh, very high because it helps us to come together and uh, bounce ideas off of each other and just sit at a round table and get to uh, learn more about what other districts are doing, what other administrators are doing, and then they bring in some really nice guest speakers as well. It's valuable because what Merck has done is they're bringing thought leaders from nationwide around the country into Mississippi where they may not get the opportunity, teachers may not get the opportunity to leave their classrooms or school administrators may not get the opportunity to leave their buildings. So by bringing the thought leaders to them, it's more customized, more personable, and it gives them the ability to talk one-on-one -on -one about what, what's going on in the state of Mississippi and how the thought leader can help them tease out what can they do better, uh, how might they change, um, innovative practices, what they're seeing across the nation. And that's an opportunity that a lot of school administrators don't get. So that's a super benefit for Merck. This is my third Merck Leadership Academy, and I've learned the value of integrating lessons with teaching as well as integrating writing across the curriculum because it's very, very important that our students are able to communicate in, through writing as well as spoken word. I think it's a remarkable opportunity for educators to be able to come together and uh, find out about new topics that they can use in the classroom, talk to each other about possibilities. Good, good chance to get together and um, learn about new possibilities. I think the Merck Leadership Academy is great. They bring in great presenters and they also give teachers um, an opportunity to get professional development on skills that are important to the classrooms now. If people have questions like more information, what should they do? Absolutely. Log in to the P3 Strategies website. That's www.p, the number three, strategies, S-T-R-A-T-E-G-I-E-S dot net.